This is Thursday, May 19, 2013. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Deborah Freed. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. May I ask you when you were born? Uh, November 9, 1957. And where were you born? Milford, Connecticut. And what town do you currently live in? Framingham, Massachusetts. What is your marital status? Married. Do you have children? No. Now, I understand that at an early age you were separated from your natural family and raised in a foster family. Yes. Can uh, you give us a little more about that? Um, foster care is, is, um, has its good points and bad points. I was lucky in that I stayed with the same family for 17 years. Mm -hmm. Um, my two older sisters uh, were not so lucky. My brother, at the time, there were four of us at the time, um, we're all pretty much a year apart um, in age, starting at uh, 55, um, when my older sister was born. And um, my brother also got lucky and stayed with the same family um, for a number of years as well. My two kid sisters came along five and six years after after that, um, they're five and six years old, younger than I am, respectively. Um, but we reacquainted um, with everyone, um, it, and in some respects, you wouldn't know that we didn't grow up together. Mm -hmm. You know. And why were you separated? Um, unfortunately, my parents were both alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And where did you uh, spend your childhood? In Meriden, Connecticut. I grew up in Meriden, Connecticut, went, went to the schools in Meriden as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you graduated from high school in Meriden? I did. Maloney High School, uh -huh. 1976. And what was Meriden, Connecticut like? It, you know, it, it, was, um, it was nice, simple, uh, middle class. For the most part, 90% of it was middle class America. Um, I lived on a street called Applewood Drive when mm -hmm. I first, my first, uh, the, the foster home that I stayed with after, I had two foster homes. First mm -hmm. one was probably six months and then this one um, lasted 17 years. Um, and then we moved to a little place called David Drive and it was a, um, I guess they call it a cul-de-sac or a, a dead end circle. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of middle class um, homes and a lot of children, mm -hmm. so you can you can play back then. You can go to the other side of the street and ride your bike around the, the circle, and you know, no harm, no foul. It was um, everybody knew everybody way mm -hmm. back when. So, I, and your foster family treated you well. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so, okay, you graduated with the bicentennial class in 1976. Yes. What'd you do afterward? Um, I worked in the factory uh, for a number of years. Um, they did uh, circuit board wiring. Um, they had a contract with the U.S. Navy mm -hmm. for the um, old style um, printers, the one with the ribbon paper. Mm. I did that for four years, and uh, you know, there were there were issues in my personal life that you know it's one of those things where you think you can run away from your problems and you can't. Mm -hmm. So at the age of uh, 23, I joined the military. Um, and even though with whatever's going on in the world today, what will ever go on in the world tomorrow, I still recommend anybody to join the military. Mm -hmm. um, it's an education you cannot get anywhere else. Um, and, the, and the ability to travel, I've been places that in the last 30 years, I haven't been since. I enjoyed that. Okay. Um, so, uh, you, uh, uh, where did you enter the military? Um, Meriden, Connecticut, actually. Okay. And you chose the Air Force, or did the Air Force choose you? Um, it was a kind of a 50-50, actually. It was the first recruiter I walked into, mm -hmm. and I did not realize that um, mm -hmm. the grades you on the, um, on the um, military task, um, which acronym is, is ASVAP. Please don't ask me what it stands for because I really Lord don't remember. Ahead. But uh, 
in order to get in the Air Force, you had to have the highest score. It's Air Force Coast Guard. Have have the same. You can have the same high score for those. Um, then it goes Navy, Army, and Marines. And I didn't realize I actually qualified for the Air Force, but he was the first recruiter I went to. Mm -hmm. And I stood at his doorway, and I looked at the man and said, if you think you're going to make me a secretary, I'm leaving. And I wish I could remember that man's name. He really, really was a, a really sweet fellow. Um, and he turns around and he says, and he starts to smile. And I asked him, I said, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I had a few other words in there, but um, I asked him if that was a good thing or a bad thing. He goes, it's a good thing. I said, for who? He goes, for both of us. So I, I probably spent the next four hours chatting with this man. Um, and, and so we agreed that, you know, went through pretty much everything. I went back a couple of times. I gave him a deadline of when I would go. And he said, why? And I said, because if I don't go within a certain period of time, I may lose my nerve and then decide not to go at all. Uh, well, once you put your name on the paperwork, you can't do that. Mm, that's not necessarily true. That's not what they tell you because it, it's those things that if you don't learn them for yourself, they're not going to tell you that. Um, once you do put your name on that paperwork, you have 72 hours to reclaim your name and you know get out of your contract. Um, but I didn't know that. And, it didn't end up being a very, very good lesson. At the age of, you know, a lot of people say, well, 18, you're a grown up, and, and, and it's not necessarily true. Um, I grew up at the age of 23, and it's my favorite year, will always be my favorite year. Um, and, you know, it worked out in my favor. I went to basic training in Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, and um, the after four weeks, you get your, your first set of orders, well, you get your orders as to where you're going to go to tech school. Um, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit, I didn't even know what the word munitions meant. <laughs> and I, asked, I had to ask somebody that, and they said, bombs and bullets. Oh, goody. Yes. I can see me with bombs and bullets. So less than a week later, I got a new set of orders, um, much to the big surprise of my training instructors. Um, because they, that never happened to either one of them in all the years that they were training instructors. For anybody in their flights, in, in the Air Force, you, they're called flights, that um, got a second set of orders. And it was to go to the same training school, but as a jet engine mechanic instead of munitions specialist. Okay, so let's, I'm always uh, happy for that. First of all, uh, I take it when you went to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas, was this your first time out of Connecticut? No, no. My first time out of Connecticut was actually going to Mississippi to uh, visit a boyfriend at the time. Um, and that was my first time flying, and that was when I was 21. Mm -hmm. um, but this would be the first time I would be away from home for more than three days. Mm -hmm. so. And you adjusted okay? I had my own apartment by then. I moved out when I was 21, so I had my own apartment. So I, you know, I think I did pretty well. Um, it really is amazing at, you know, the amount of time and energy the military puts into a person. And my biggest fear was failure. I, I saw it that I could not afford to fail, not because of the expect, not because of the expense the military puts out but because I didn't know what I would go back to. I gave up a, a reasonably decent job um, to join the military. Um, and the reason I gave up the job was because I wanted to move in a different, to a different section in the company that I worked for. And my, my supervisor um, would not let me do that. I basically, I couldn't make a lateral move, which is what it was, or couldn't move up because um, they liked the job that I did, mm -hmm. and I said, well, I'm joining the Air Force and, or joining the military. And this little four-foot-something woman turns around and says, no, you're not. I'm like, um, bye. Wow. So I did. So, you know, but uh, I gave the recruiter um, three months to find space for me, and he did, um, because I really was afraid I would lose my nerve. Um, and uh, but I made it work. 
And second of all, you're joining the military at an interesting time when women seem to have garnered more opportunities. At that time, they did. Um, it, it was it, the the military was still you know somewhat old school. Women did secretary jobs, men did the mechanical jobs, and it was a big push for um, women to get back into the mechanical jobs because it was it's well proven, especially during World War One and World War, or especially during World War Two, that women could do the same jobs, if not just as well, if not better than some of the men who did those jobs mm -hmm. during World War II. And then when the fellows started coming home from World War II, um, women got pushed out of those jobs and back into the house. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you have gotten your orders to become a jet engine mechanic. Yeah. And are we still at Lackland? Or? No, nope. no, after, after uh, six weeks, I got transferred to uh, Chanute Air Force Base, which is in, uh, Rantoul, no, yeah, Rantoul, Illinois, about 17 miles uh, from Champaign, mm -hmm. where the university was. And if you wanted to go, you could hang out in Rantoul, which didn't have very much. You basically walked down the street, and there, there was your, there was a little town. But if you wanted to go do anything, you took a cab ride 17 miles. And the very first time. I went off base um, with some friends. We took a cab ride into Champaign, and I'm looking around, and I'm looking around, and the cab driver's watching. He goes, you haven't figured it out yet. I was like, something not right here. I was like, what's missing? He goes, hills, flat. I'd never been anywhere <laughs> where it was that flat before. Never. And, and he's laughing, his, you know, he's just laughing at me. It's like, okay, you win. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, it was, it was really interesting. So I love the fact that I got to travel. Mm -hmm. I, I did, I love the fact that I got to travel. So. And you did okay in uh, mechanic school? I, I made it. Um, they, the Jet Engine program way back when had what they call blocks for education. It was two week blocks. Mm -hmm. And I actually missed the first block by two points. So mm -hmm. I had to repeat it. And, um, and so that did not make me at all happy because the people that I had been in basic training with, some of them went to uh, Chanute as well. And even though they were in different schools in Chanute, they, we were still in the same dormitory type thing. Um, and so they, they graduated two weeks before I did. But my philosophy is, is that I still graduated. Um, the, the military gives you at least you know, at the very least, one opportunity to, to um, fail, and you get a second chance, and I got that second chance. Mm -hmm. um, I, there were gentlemen, there were, there were two young men um, who were also in the jet engine program who failed the second time, um, and their choice was to either get out of the military or to transfer into something that didn't require training, and so they chose to transfer. Mm -hmm. um, you are there, basically, you really are there at the discretion of the military. Um, I had one young woman in basic training in my flight um, who was actually being considered um, to uh, be released by Uncle Sam because the summer before she joined the military, she was a softball player and broke her hand. And so they wanted, one of her fingers didn't, mend properly, or at least so they said. Um, so they were actually going to kick her out. And she comes to me um, and says, well, how do you get to stay? And because I was born when, with a cleft palate and a cleft lip. And it's like, because I'm not gonna let them kick me out. And I ended up being, for lack of a better term, Uncle Sam's guinea pig when it came to that. And, um, but I said, so fight it if you want to stay and fight it. And from what I know, she did. Mm -hmm. She did. I never saw her after, after uh, basic training. But, you know, as far as I know, she stayed in, and, and I don't know whether she made a career out of it. But mm -hmm. that's what, if, if you want to, you know, to do things, you advocate for yourself. Because that's the only way you're going to learn anything. Um, learn, you know, what the do's and don'ts are, more or less. Um, and that's when I became a, a, an advocate for myself as well. Mm -hmm. Now tell us a little more about the 
the jet engine mechanic program itself. What did you? What were you learning? Um, you learned to. Um, jet engines basically were brought in for mostly repairs. We did not build them up, so to speak. But that's what you learned in um, school. Was you know all of the different parts, and you actually built them up in school. But when I went to my first duty station, we did 98% were repairs and replacement is what we did. Um, I worked on, when I went to my first duty station, which was Loring, Maine, was we worked on, we had two separate um, engine shops. One dealt with B-52 engines and the other one dealt with KC-135 engines. And that's the shop that I ended up in, was KC-135s. KC-135s. Yeah. And what were KC-135s? Those were the, um, those are actually cargo planes. Those were mostly fueling planes for um, the, the jets. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly don't remember what jets we had. We probably had F-15s, but F-15s take off with basically one type of fuel um, and then they get refueled in the air. Um, but but KC-135s were mostly refueling planes. And where in Maine were you stationed? Loring, Maine. Um, some people will call it Boring Loring, um, <laughs> or otherwise known as 300 miles of potato country. Um, it basically, it's five miles inside the Canadian border. It's as far, pretty much as northeast as you can get in Maine. So. And no 17-mile cab rides to uh, Champlain, huh? No. The best you could do is if you wanted to go to a real mall was four hours to Bangor. And how long were you at this duty station? Um, 16 months. 16 months. I got there June, yeah, June, I think it was June. June of 81 and left in November of 82. Now, did anything happen to you uh, when you were on uh, in in Maine? I, um, as I spoke about a little while ago about being Uncle Sam's guinea pig, um, when I was in basic training, I got a note to go to see the oral surgeon, so I did. Um, and you know, we we discussed um, future um, facial reconstruction, um, and so I said, well, you know, I have to get to my first duty station. I have to actually, you know, graduate basic training and then graduate my, my training school. And I get to Loring, Maine, and I'm two weeks there, and I get another little notice to go to the oral surgeon. And I didn't make these appointments. And I was really, really cross. It's like, why can't they just leave me alone? Why can't they just, you know, I was a guinea pig all my life for medical reasons because of the cleft palate. I really didn't care. So I go see the oral surgeon. He's a major, and another, you know, I know a lot of people think that uh, military brass can be real hard, but this this gentleman was just great. He really was. He's like, look, he goes, you provide, you know, to, for lack of a better way of putting it, you're actually providing a great service because they use you for training medical doctors for in the field for facial reconstruction, you know, um, IEDs, you know, they, they are the, the the new word these days, and um, he goes, you're gonna, everything that's gonna happen to you is free. Um, Uncle Sam's picking up the tab, and you might as well do it, because what are you gonna do on the outside? Once I start work, I'm on my own. Made a point. So I say, okay, I write the letter back to the Lackland Air Force Base, and they send me a notice of when I could go down, and I have to go through my squadron commander, get permission to go down, and I had already talked to my section commander and everybody, and they said yes. And the quadrant commander said no. It was considered elective surgery. And it's like, okay. I go back to the oral surgeon, and he's like, no, it doesn't work that way. It's like, yeah, but he outranks you. It doesn't matter. And, and put it this way, my squadron commander didn't speak to me after that. Oh, <laughs> I, go, just, you know, go, okay. So I had my surgery down in Lackland. I spent 12, about 12 weeks with my mouth wired shut down at Lackland because I was stationed up in Loring, Maine. They didn't allow me to go home because of the weather. 
um, and I had to walk around with a pair of clippers um, to cut the wires in case I got sick. Um, but uh, it was a, you know, I look at that part and it's like I would have done anything to work during that time, but they didn't, you know, they didn't see it that way. Um, whether I provided, you know, um, good training, I don't know. But I've never had to have it repaired since. I and that was in 1981, or the I'm sorry, January of '82. Um, I had the surgery, so it's over 30 years old. Yeah, no, 20 years old. No, 30, 30 years old. Mm -hmm. Thank you, 30 Welcome. years old. And so, um, you know, but uh, it all worked out well. That's all I can say about it. it all worked out well. Okay, so what happened then? Um, I, I put in for orders to go overseas. Um, one of the things that some people that I had met and made friends with recommended is like, if you join the military, join it to travel. Mm -hmm. You know, see the world as much of it as you can. And I'd always had a, a thing for, for, you know, oriental, um, you know, um, education type things. Um, and I, I'm ashamed to admit I didn't, I didn't, you know, use that time as well as I could have. But I put in for orders to go to Japan. Um, some friends of mine put in orders to go to uh, Europe. So I went to Japan and they went to Europe. I went to uh, Kadena Air Base, Okinawa, Japan. So. so tell us what that was like. That, you know, if you're into water sports and uh, diving, it's a great opportunity. Um, the the biggest issue with that is that, depending upon who you worked for, you didn't have to take leave. If you, if you were um, in good standing, as it were, mm -hmm. for lack of a better way of putting it, if you were in good standing, you know, no trouble, you could, you know, you let your, your crew chief know or your, your immediate supervisor know, look, I'm taking this trip, I'm leaving Friday night, I'll be back Monday morning, okay, fine. Anything happens, you get docked three days of leave. Okay, but as long as you let somebody know that that's what you were doing, um, you could do that. In Europe, the USO is extremely great in Europe because they, they provided all these little tours. You get on a bus on Friday, 5 o'clock, Monday morning, as long as you were back at work, depend, again, depending mm -hmm. upon who you worked for, what, what section or what squadron you worked for. But in Okinawa, it's a lot harder because you're on an island. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, you, you can take a boat but you're not going very far um, in a short period of time. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, you, you had opportunities to learn the language. I learned how to drive over there. They drive on the other side of the road over there. Um, you know, there were, there, were, there were some opportunities. But um, one of the things that I like to brag about a little bit is that uh, when I was, I had to go see the dentist. Um, I, had been a, I had a problem with one of my teeth. so. I'm waiting in the dentist office, and there was a magazine, and I could go to Europe one way for $350. And it's like, wow, from Oakland, California. So, um, and like I said, most of my friends had gone to Europe, so I was gonna go to Europe on a vacation. And it, it worked out well. There, there was such a thing called military hops. And if there was room on a plane, you could pay 10 or $20 and get on a plane. Military hops um, was based on basically rank. So if someone outranked you and they were going to the same place, then you got bumped out of your seat. Um, and I spent seven, my very first time of taking a military hop, paid my $10, I spent 17 hours in a 141, another type of cargo plane, me, cargo, and unfortunately, two caskets. 17 hours. Um, I like to brag that I left Kadena Air Base at five in the morning on, I think it was something like March 17th, and arrived in Oakland, California at three in the morning on March 17th. Yeah. <laughs> and what was your rank at the time? Um, I was a... E, E3, I was a senior, what was called e, senior airman at the time. Okay. And you're still a mechanic? Um, yes and no. I, um, I had injured my back in a, in a fall, um, just, you know, 
minding my own business and fell off the, the you know, a ledge. I was sitting on a ledge of our of our barracks and fell off the wrong side, ten feet. And so I had to have light duty, and um, I I worked in the office of all the things I didn't want to be. It was one thing that I was was a secretary. Mm -hmm. um, but I am proud of the fact that they have military inspections. Um, every year, major military inspections, MMIs, as we called them in the Air Force, and they inspected everything from your little canteen mm -hmm. in your, in your uh, building all the way up to the uh, squadron commander's office. Um, and it was the very first time that the office in my, my engine shop made an outstanding. Um, it actually won me three days of, of leave for free. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very proud of that because it, it had never received, it received ex acceptables in the past, but it had never received an outstanding. Um, and it's, it's pretty neat when you have a um, high ranking non-commissioned officer tell his boss, who's slightly higher than him and officers, that he can leave the office um, with just an, uh, a senior airman in charge of the office and know that whatever's going on he knows everything, and everything's being done appropriately. Mm -hmm. So I take that as a great compliment, mm -hmm. um, you know. But uh, and then nine months later, after the first injury, I had a second fall, and this was after I was allowed to go back to active duty or full duty, I should say, not active duty, full duty. Um, I was inside um, in Okinawa. The jet engine shop that I worked with was F-15s. Um, and the engines, they're all different. You know, they, they all have the same capabilities, but they are um, built differently um, for different, you know, um, different, you know, to do different things, so to speak. And, and the, um, the, F, the afterburner of an F-15 is about eight, eight and a half feet tall when you're standing on its end, okay? Well, you can't put it on cement because it's, it's metal. Um, I don't want to call it stainless steel, but the, the frame would bend. So we had to put them up on wooden blocks. And way back when, mm -hmm. I was thin enough, I could slide eight inches underneath and get inside and do the work that needs to be done. Um, and then I happened to be on a footstool, and I'm just jamming away and working, and I reached up. but what I needed to reach was a little taller than I was, and I didn't realize my feet were at the edge of the footstool. Um, and the footstool goes out and um, And put it this way, we have an engine shop that had 96 people in it. 95 of them heard the choice words I had mm -hmm. for landing on my, on my butt. Um, I waited a couple of days and, and then I had to go back to the clinic because my back, I just, I could barely move and had bruising up and down my back. And so um, after my first injury, which was only nine months before that, the, the uh, orthopedist that I had been seeing um, suggested surgery. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I, I find a little ridiculous is that in Okinawa, the biggest, ba the biggest medical facility is a Navy hospital. Well, I'm Air Force. In emergencies, everybody goes to the Navy hospital. Um, we had Army, Marine, Navy, Air Force. We had all of them in this little tiny, tiny island. And everybody goes to, to the hospital for emergencies. But once you're done with your emergencies, you go to your respective facilities. Well, Kadena only had a clinic. So the biggest hospital was down in Clark Air Base in the Philippines. I've been to Clark Air Base seven times. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where I had to go to have my surgery. Um, and the first back surgery was really great. Um, I had um, Harrington rods, which are stainless steel rods, about eight inches long, and they, they align next to your spinal col mm -hmm. column on either side. And I had a fusion done, and it was great. It really was, because I could do 98% of everything I did before. I injured my back. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that didn't really change very much about what I could do. And then, um, well, military was good to me and um, in a lot of ways, I made, I made a few mistakes, a couple of really big ones. Um, I got a DUI 
while I was in the military, um, and that, that resulted in what we call an Article 15. Um, basically, that's, um, at least for me, it was a loss of rank, loss of pay, and uh, two weeks of extra duty. Um, and one of the things I learned, again, um, in advocating for myself was, if you don't make the next rank, Uncle Sam is not required to keep you. Okay, well, I learned that, and I really wanted to re-enlist, and I had about nine months left. And so I wanted to re-enlist, and they, you know, I did all the paperwork, I behaved myself, I, have, I had a six month type thing, um, and that's when I had my first surgery during that six months of behaving myself, um, no driving anyway, lost my license for a year. You know what, um, it, was a, it was one of the most humiliating and embarrassing situations I've ever been in, but it was also one of the best lessons I ever learned. I ran a stop sign and got caught. That's two in the morning, and it was my own bloody fault. I deserved everything I got, mm -hmm. but after, you know, I paid my penance, I, I was really, I really did want to re-enlist. And I had this one individual, um, again, whose name I, I do not remember, and I would not stay here anyway, but who said no. Everyone else said yes. But because he said no, my paperwork couldn't go further. They said, wait, wait, wait. And it's like, okay, fine. Well, I don't have a great deal of patience sometimes. So I tried again, and it was the same individual who said no. Um, I even had a chief master sergeant go back for me. When you're a three-striper and have someone at that rank go back for you, you're not doing too bad. I had a deal with the chief master sergeant, and we agreed, if, and he said that, you know, he would research my story, and if he found out I lied, he would bust me all the way down to nothing, and bye-bye. And you know what? That's fine. I told him that. I said, we have a deal. I didn't lie once. I made a mistake. I owned up to it, made a mistake. I want to re-enlist, and this, these are the things that I need to do. And he says, okay. So he goes to bat for me, and that same person said no. Oh well, I got, I'm down to eight months. I bought a car, I put it on reserve, I started making plans. Some of my friends were leaving to go back stateside, finish up their tours on stateside. I had it all mapped out. Um, five months before I was due to get out of the military, I had my second back surgery. Um, way back when, and this is um, something that I should have been better advocating for myself better at, the uh, Clark Air Base found out that I was due to be separated from the military. And so they said, well, you didn't come in with the Harrington rods, you're not going home with them. So nine months after my first back surgery, I had my second back surgery to remove the Harrington rods. Um, and then I had a lot of problems with, with my abilities to walk and stuff. And I got accused by a number of people of faking it so I can get compensation. Um, you know what? For someone who was already born with a disability, I didn't have to fake anything. I know what pain is. I know what surgery is. I couldn't be bothered, you know. Uh, two weeks after I had the back surgery, I have to go see the new person who replaced the captain. And I see the new person, he's a major, and we sit down and we chat about, you know, what I did, what I did wrong, why I should be given a reprieve, and so forth and so on. And I actually won my rank back, and um, I left the military as an E-4 sergeant. But what I'm most proud of is the fact that I advocated for myself, and I actually left the military with an honorable discharge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if people leave the military with a general under honorable conditions, you get, you know, benefits. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of VA benefits, but to leave uh, uh, with an honorable, that's, that's something. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, you know, I had the opportunity to reenlist, but now I got a back problem. And you know what, no, I, I can't, I can't now. I asked to have the, the surgery to put the rods back in, and they said, no, it's too soon. You can't do that. 
it was it, they just took him out in, in Nova, at the end of November, and it's like, we can't go back and put him back because you want to re-enlist. Well, I can't re-enlist under the circumstances. I did not think that I could re-enlist under the conditions that I was suffering from because, number one, it wasn't fair to me, nor would it have been fair to Uncle Sam. Right. So you left the military in 1985? I'm sorry? 1985? 1985. May of 1985. I left the military. Okay. Um, and you left as with the rank of E4, but without the rods. Without the rods, yep. So... Yep. I could still walk then. Um, uh -huh. I was in reasonably good health. Otherwise, um, I picked up my brand new car in Reno, Nevada. I had it all mapped out. Figured once I got home, I was going to have to work, really work. Mm -hmm. And so I had money put aside and I had a road trip planned out. Um, I wrote letters to my friends. I'm going to be here on, you know, between these dates. I'm going to be there on these dates. If you don't hear from me by these dates, contact this person. And if this person doesn't know where I am, then call out the National Guard. Um, it, was, it was really a big joke. But, you know, mm -hmm. I had it all mapped out. I drove from Oakland, California down to San Diego to see friends, um, across to New Mexico, Arizona, Texas. Um, I had friends in Florida, up, up the East Coast. Um, I reacquainted myself with my brother in 1985. Um, he lived in Pennsylvania. He still lives in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, what was basically going to be three weeks turned into six. But it was great. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, brand new car, put over six. I think I put six thousand miles on a brand new car. It was great. It really was. It was one of the best things I ever did. Mm -hmm. I would love to do it again, not necessarily by myself, um, but uh, it was really a great trip. I made some new friends um, on my trip, and and it was funny because I had people, you know, who knew I was going on this trip, and they were telling me, "It's like you can't take this trip." Well, why not? Because you're by yourself and you're a girl. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to bother me. <laughs> and they really don't want to, you know, nobody's going to bother me. And, and everybody knew. My, my family knew where I was going to be because my money went, you know, I pulled away some money at home. And my, my uh, foster parents had, were co-signers on my, my, check, my savings account. So I would have to call my mother up and say, hey, Mom, I need some money. This is what I need. This is where you send it. OK. Or I'd call up, and it's like, where are you now? Oh, Mom, I'm in, I'm in Texas. Um, I'm going to Florida next, remember? OK. Mm -hmm. So um, and I had um, put in uh, paperwork for compensation. It's one of those things that if you don't apply, you're never going to know whether, you, whether you're entitled or not. There was no, there's no guarantee that you're going to get it. Um, so I had applied before I left, and um, uh, you know I would always inquire about mail. Uh, mom, what mail did I get? And it's like, well, you got this, this, and this. And it's like, uh, you got to open that letter, Mom. And it was from the VA, and it was to tell me what my dates were for my compensation exam. And what people really need to remember is that when you're given a date for a compensation exam, if you don't keep it, you've blown it. You know, you've blown it. So um, I knew what the date was. I knew when I had to be back in Connecticut, you know, everything. Um, it was great. It was really, really great. Um, I wouldn't trade that part. There are a lot of things in the military I wouldn't trade mm -hmm. at all. You know, I got out in May of 85. Um, I worked for six months in a factory. We actually made um, little diodes, take the little tiny pin, and put it in a little tiny cup that went on a, um, on a circuit board. Um, I did that for six months, and then I had my third back surgery in um, 1986. I think it's somewhere between January and February 1986. Um, and they, they, what they did was, because the rods, they refused to put rods back in, but they extended the fusion, the original fusion, from L1 to L3, now down to L5. So my lower back is, is basically one, one block. Um, and I, I still was active. I worked as much as I could work. I worked, um, I got a job working for Pratt & Whitney Aircraft, which is in, mostly based in Connecticut. Um, and I could do that job for two years. 
then um, I couldn't do that anymore. My back couldn't take it. Um, I got a job working in the uh, uh, data operations for Cigna Systems, which was an insurance company um, in, um, uh, not Manchester. I think it's, maybe it was Manchester, um, Connecticut. Um, and so I did that for four years, but that got to be a problem because my legs, I always thought it was the job itself because you spend eight to 10 hours a day on your, on your, on your feet. Mm -hmm. So it was, I always thought it was the, the job itself. And I had to leave that job. Um, then I decided, well, you know what? High school education isn't really gonna get me anywhere. So Uncle Sam, I was allowed into the voc vocational rehab program in 1991. And uh, they figured the best job for me at the time, what I went to school for was, believe it or not, um, librarian. And um, so I grad by, the, by the time I graduated um, in 1994, I needed to use a wheelchair to get around in big spaces. I could no longer do the college campus walking around it. Um, and so I needed a chair for big spaces, go to the mall, um, go to air shows, um, you know, that type of thing. And then over the years, it got to be where my, my, big, my big places or spaces um, have slowly gotten smaller and smaller. Um, I can't sit into in specific chairs. The, the gentleman doing the photography, if I sat in that chair that he's sitting in, which is a hard back, um, hard, hard seat and hard back, I wouldn't walk mm -hmm. in the afternoon. And, and God bless you for being able to sit there as long as you have. Um, but um, we, we discovered that I had a condition. Um, in 1995, we discovered a condition that I have called arachnoiditis. Oh, I love the look I get with that. I do, because it's like everybody knows, most everybody knows what arachnoid or arachnid stands for. It's spiders. Mm -hmm. um, you have three layers to your spinal column. The middle layer looks like an enclosed spider web. Itis, I-T-I-S, is inflammation. So what happens is the more I walk, the more it inflames, the more it inflames, the more it pushes out, the more it pushes out, the more pain it creates to where I will actually, um, my it starts with my right leg. Um, it gets numb to where I've lost the feeling in my right leg completely. I've fallen downstairs. I've almost broken my ankle twice. I broke a finger once um, because I couldn't maintain my balance. Mm -hmm. um, we have actually had to move once so far because of that. Um, but uh, arachnoiditis is actually listed in the National Organization for Rare Diseases. So um, that's how we discovered that through an MRI. Um, how you get that condition is there's three ways, well, there's probably more than three ways, but according to the National Organization of Rare Diseases, you get that condition. Um, you can get it either through a virus or many women um, and some men who have had epidurals, more women than men, because of children, childbearing, have suffered this because the epidural was not done correctly. They don't know why their legs hurt. Um, but that's the reason why. And the third reason is the way I did, because I have no children, I've never had that type of virus, um, is from an oil-based myelogram dye. Um, if you don't know what a myelogram is, it's a medical test that puts a dye into a specific area to see where nerves and blood vessels are being pinched off. And 1985, December of 1985, they used this uh -huh. oil-based dye. And in 1995, when I had an MRI, they could prove that it was oil-based dye because you could still see it in my back 10 years later. Wow. So, but. Okay, tell us how you became involved in the Paralyzed Veterans of America. Um, I worked for the VA as a secretary in the radiology service from 1995 to 2001. And again, part of the issue was I wanted a position in the same office. Um, I, I felt that I was in, you know, I had done the job um, for a year and a half 
of the of the higher position, and I thought I should be, you know, entitled to get it. Well, at the time, the chief of the service said no, because the philosophy behind it was, if I got the secretary's job um, or the admin assistant's job, was that then they could not replace me as a secretary. Okay, but I've been doing both jobs for a year and a half. Um, and it really wasn't about the money. Um, if anybody knows about federal um, steps, as they're called, you, you have to basically be at a certain level in order to move up in the world, so to speak. Um, at least that's my philosophy. The way I saw it then, it's the way I see it now. Um, you know, if you wanted to, to, to graduate and move up, that was, you had to be something like a, a, a grade seven, and I was only a grade six. The, ad, the admin assistant's job was a grade seven. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really about the money, it was about being able to use my education, because in that time, I had gotten a master's degree. Um, I had earned my, me and my partner paid for my master's degree um, outright. It was, a, it was one of those new programs. Um, Central Michigan was doing an extended learning program, and it was extremely um, affordable. There were approximately 22 in our group, um, 19 or 18 of which were um, VA employees. And the instructors would come out to you every other weekend um, or every weekend for six weeks. And that's what we did. It, it's the new, it was the former, it was the developing program for what's, you know, now is online. And, and so the instructors would come out to you and the VA would allow us to use the conference rooms. We didn't have to pay for that space. So, um, but the VA, and again, I need to reiterate this, did not pay for the education of anybody. Um, everybody paid for their own education. Um, some departments um, gave you what was called step increases after you got your degree, other departments did not. Mine was one that did not. Um, so when the chief said no, I could not get the new job, then I left. Um, was it a good thing or a bad thing? I look at it now, one door closes, another opens. Um, back then, however, it was a difficult decision because I was gonna go to law school. I failed law school. I only had one year of law school and I failed. So I tried to get back into the VA. It didn't work out. I tried to get just pretty much any job I could get. It didn't work out. I remained unemployed for three years to where depression was beginning to be a very serious problem for me. My partner worked, my family worked, my friends worked, I wasn't working. Um, so what I had to do was, um, you know, for some reason I didn't understand the, the premise of SSDI. I knew what SSI was. I had a former partner I helped get SSI for, um, and I knew what that was, but I didn't really, for some reason, I don't know why I didn't click. I didn't understand the premise of SSDI. Well, we're, you're entitled to SSDI because you paid into it. it, it it's not an, entitle, an entitlement program the way they use that word. It's an entitlement program that you have paid into, a benefit that you are entitled to get because you paid into it. And so in um, 2003, I did all of the research for applying for SSDI. And that is one thing that I continue to advocate for. Do your own homework. Don't expect other people to do it for you. Social Security Administration, even back then, had a great website. It continues to have one of the better websites for government websites. Um, and so I did all the research and I actually found on their website, they list over 400 modalities that Social Security Administration will cover, and arachnoiditis is on that, in that 400 modality list. I could not believe it. I'd never heard of it before I, we discovered it, you know, in 1995. So I applied, and I won first time out, um, which is also rare. Most people who apply for SSDI don't get it first time, but I won it first time out. And um, then I did not know that I could be um, in the spinal cord injury clinic at West Roxbury VA um, because I, I still walked. I figured, you know, growing up, 
you knew about paraplegics and quadriplegics, but I never knew there were so many different levels of those those mm -hmm. modalities. I never knew that. You know, you're growing up paraplegic, somebody who can't walk. That's it. You know, um, I am termed an incomplete paraplegic because I do suffer a spinal cord injury. I will eventually lose the use of my right leg, but for right now, it's still there. Mm -hmm. um, but um, um, in 2000. Um, at the end of 2003, there was a women veterans luncheon, and one of the attendees was a social worker who worked for spinal cord injury, and she wanted to know why I was not, she did not see me in her clinic. And so she got me in the clinic, and um, they have, the spinal cord injury has what's called an annual exam, and it's basically inside out, top to bottom exam. Um, Back then, it was it was a two day thing, and so rehab medicine is is one of them. I had a wheelchair that was almost ninety five, eight years old, and so I was entitled to get a new wheelchair. And so rehab medicine takes care of that department. And in rehab medicine, they had this poster for the National Veterans Wheelchair Games, and it's co sponsored by the Veterans Administration and Paralyzed Veterans of America. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like, I want to do that. I'd never done anything like it before. Um, when I was growing up, um, we were uh, girls weren't allowed to participate in sports. Um, long story, but we, mm -hmm. we don't need to go there. But anyway, I figured, you know what? I'm, I was at the point to where I was stuck, physically, emotionally, and mentally. I was just stuck. And so um, I inquired about how how does one go to that. Well, you got to be a member of the organization, of the chapter. Um, PVA does not necessarily re require that you be a member of PVA at the time, but the chapter did because they were going to sponsor you financially, mm -hmm. at least in part or all. So basically, um, make a long story short, is I got to be a member. I started volunteering in 2004. Um, uh, the then president, um, Ken Medeiros, um, I don't know why he liked me, but he did, and I'm very grateful for that. He turned out to be a good friend and a great mentor um, in a lot of ways. And so I got to go to my first veterans games in St. Louis, Missouri. All I'd ever seen of St. Louis was the arch and the airport <laughs> up to that point. Um, so, um, you know, and we had to pay if my partner went with me, we have to pay um, for her share. Um, chapter doesn't pay for that. Um, so that was fine. So we, we got to go to the Veterans Games, and that was, that was really cool. Were you a spectator or an athlete? Oh, no, I was an athlete. Mm -hmm. um, if you went with, um, you had to participate in a minimum of two events and a maximum of five. Um, and so I didn't realize at the time the field events were considered separate events. I didn't know that. Um, I know in school they're not. They're, you know, it's a field event, you know. So I had applied for the javelin, the shot put, the discus, um, archery, air guns, and, and there were two more. I forget which ones. And, um, and so um, it's like, oh no, you, you have seven, you can only do five. And so I had to give up two. And, and so we did, and, and it was great. It was a great, it's it basically five days. Um, I've met people there um, that are still friends today. Um, matter of fact, I'm going to San Antonio next week seeing a friend that I met there. Um, it's the world's largest wheelchair athletic event. Um, you will, it's 600 wheelchair users in one place at one time. It is different than the Paralympics in that um, number one, all athletes, whether they're a single amputee, double amputee, must use a wheelchair to participate in sports. That's number one. And the other big thing is all are veterans. It's, it's limited to veterans. We have, there is a Great Britain team that comes to the Veterans Games every year um, because they are veterans. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've gone, let's see, four, Six, seven, eight, 
11, 12. Yeah, 4, 6, 7, 8, 11, 12. Six out of the last um, nine years I've gone. Um, we went to Anchorage, Alaska in 2006. Cool. And we turned mm -hmm. that into um, a three-week vacation because um, I, I was not legally employed at the time. Oh, yes, I was. I take that back. I was. Um, I was employed at the time. Mm -hmm. um, what, what started out as a volunteer position at PVA or at the New England chapter, um, less than a year later, turned into a paid employee position as government relations director. Mm -hmm. And um, which was good and bad because, like I said, I had applied for SSDI. I won that. And getting involved in PVA, my compensation, because I'd been unemployed for three years, I had a, um, a, a national service officer at PVA who helped get me what was called a temporary disability of 100%. I was rated 60% in 2003, and he, um, you know, it took a couple years, but he got me a temporary 100%. So now, in 2004, I am getting approximately yeah, $3,200 tax rate. And the late Ken Medeiros offers me a job. Okay. I would give up the SSDI and go back to my 60%, or, or I could keep all of that, or give those up and take the job. Well, some people call me a nut, say I'm bad for business, um, but a quality of life issue, and I talk to everybody, everybody I can think of, friends, not so close friends, all my family, even my, my power of attorney, everybody. Um, there was only one person who said I should keep the money and volunteer. Well, if I can volunteer for 30 hours a week, I can work 30 hours a week. And so for me, it was a very, very personal quality of life issue. So I chose to work. Um, I gave up the SSDI and I gave up the temporary 100%, went back to 60%. Um, and I've been an employee uh, since 2005 for PVA, okay. for the New England chapter of PVA. So tell us more about the New England chapter for the Paralyzed Veterans of America. Uh, what programs do they offer? We, um, they're one of their big programs, not the biggest program, but one of their big programs is sports and recreation. Mm -hmm. um, it's always been the philosophy of, of PVA that sports and recreation does a great deal more than just, you know, um, rehab medicine. It gets, you know, it's, it really does involve body, mind, and spirit. Um, and that was one of the things for me because um, in 2004, I had actually gone back to um, counseling. Um, when I got involved with PBA, I was volunteering. Um, you know, um, I learned that they had an advocacy and legislative program. And one of the things with, with the late Ken Medeiros, he passed away in 2008, was he had offered me the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. in March of 2004. And I told him, I said, we couldn't afford it. Um, you know, being unemployed for three years, we ran up some debt, and mostly my doing, but we did run up some debt, and we were trying to watch the debt. And so I said we couldn't afford it. He goes, oh, no, no, no. He goes, well, we'll pay for it, you pay it back. And no, you don't understand. We really can't afford this. He goes, and, and he was teasing, but I took it to heart because it was really embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And I started to cry, and he got really nervous. He said, no, 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 no. He goes, I'd like you to go to Washington, D.C. with us. And we go to Washington, D.C. twice a year, and the big one is for PBA's um, advocacy and legislative program. All the chapters send people, and New England was no exception. We usually send four or five people. And so you go, you meet with legislators. Um, the reason why you, it's, it's a big deal in Washington is because 90% nine, of the time is all of your district legislators, all of your congressional legislators are there in one place for a week, mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, and so you get to visit, and so I, I loved it. It was bam, bam, bam. Fifteen minutes in this office, fifteen minutes in that office, 
go here, go there. And I was exhausted at the end of the week. And so a week later, he asked me, he goes, so what'd you think? I said, I think you're in a lot of trouble. I said, because I really enjoyed it. I really did. I really enjoyed it. And so um, the New England chapter um, has been basically my, my lifesaver and my home for the last nine years. Um, we offer advocacy and legislation. We have a, a nursing scholarship program. We have um, um, sports and recreation. We have a great What's It Like program. And in that program, there are a number of individuals who get together and go to um, sometimes elementary schools and junior high schools and say the difference between you and I is the fact that you can still use your two legs. I just need four wheels to do the same thing. There is very, very little that you can do that I can't. Very little. Um, you know, so, so that's what we teach children, not to be afraid of the wheelchair. We help them understand that, you know what, there is very little difference. And that um, the ability, it's not a disability. It's you choose what your abilities can be. Uh, and in, in today's, you know, tech-savvy world, People can do just about everything, you know, everything. Uh, I mean, look at the great Stephen Hawkins. Um, there's a uh, Congressman Jim Langevin who uh, unfortunately suffered a, a bullet wound at the age of 16 um, as a police cadet. Uh, and he's a congressman in Rhode Island. Um, so, you know, and, and we work with him, um, you know, some of the other, other programs I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, obviously legislation, sports and recreation, what's it like, nursing scholarship, research and education. We have an annual golf tournament that we use to raise money for research and we donate to um, Yale um, and because they actually have a facility at the West Haven VA, um, spinal cord injury research facility at the West Haven VA that they do. Um, and so that's where our, our research money, most of it goes there. Um, we're not opposed to um, you know, sponsoring little bits here and there. Um, our national organization um, sponsors individuals who are doing spinal cord research um, with, with, with some major grants, um, you know, some small, some large, depending upon the program. Um, you know, we have um, our, our sporting program our, our current sports program, we have a basketball team, we have a bowling team, we have um, a billiards tournament coming up um, later this month. We, have, um, we are partnering with our national organization for our first ever trap shoot, which is gonna be in Scarborough, Maine um, at the end of uh, June. You know, it's, it's all about getting out there and doing things. It's all about advocating, um, you know, not to be different. Um, it's all about making life universal for everybody. Um, you know, we have a, we're, we're working on um, developing um, an access program where um, when the ADA was created in 1991, um, they set a certain standard that, you know, certain facilities, whether they're, they're publicly owned or government owned or privately owned, um, but they allow public use, have to meet certain criteria. Mm -hmm. And there's a, uh, um, in the ADA, there's a program called a self-evaluation and transition plan. And each city and town in the US, not just here in Massachusetts, were obligated to create a plan. Um, and it could stretch over a period of years. It didn't have to be where you have to do everything in six months. And you have to empty your budget and make your entire town accessible mm -hmm. in six months. Um, however, if after a certain period of time you didn't even have a, a self-evaluation transition plan, then the Department of Justice could step in and say, you have a problem and we just made it bigger. Because now they would do their own self-evaluation, the J Department of Justice would do its own self-evaluation plan and pick its priorities for the town. Um, that's a bad thing because it would cost the town a great deal of money. Town or city, it didn't matter. Um, it really didn't matter. But the uh, town of Framingham, I'm proud to say, as well as the town of Natick, had it, you know, did their self-evaluation plan several years ago um, before any major complaints came up. So there, you know, 
um, getting around town is easier. Mm -hmm. Now, what is your current position with the chapter? Um, I went from being government relations director and a board member to um, I have been elevated to executive director. And how long have you been executive director? Um, since October of 2012, legally, with the name and the money to go with it, since October of 2012. But for the last four years, when our chapter, our former chapter president um, passed away, um, the current chapter president and I, we have a great working relationship. Um, I'm a pain in, I'm a thorn in his side, he's a thorn in my side, but we take care of each other, we work well together. Um, and I've been doing, uh, you know, basically the responsibilities of managing the office for the last three years. Mm -hmm. um, what PVA did last year, the national organization did, was they changed some of the bylaws. And then one bylaw used to be that a chapter could decide that if you're a member, you could be an employee as well as a board member. Well, the national organization said mm, no. They, there was a, a resolution, what we call a resolution, and the National Board of Directors voted to say, no, you have to be either or. No disrespect, but there's no money in being um, a, a vice president on a board. You can get your expenses, mm -hmm. but we, I was not financially prepared to just do that right now. So I asked to, to be elevated to executive director. I asked for what I thought was a reasonable increase in the salary. I am very proud of the fact that um, not only the chapter president, but the board of directors said yes, and they actually gave me more money than I had asked for. So I really can't complain. I have a, mm. I, really, I really can't complain. Right. You know, I, I do what I do mm -hmm. because I enjoy what I do. What do you think are some of the challenges uh, facing the PVA these days? Um, the biggest, I think the biggest challenge is that, you know, some people still don't understand why veterans are held to a higher, or not held to a higher standard, but I really hate this word because it's not the right word I want to use, but it's the only one that comes up, is entitled. Mm -hmm. um, I know there are better words than that, but unfortunately right now that's, that's the best word I have. Um, there are some people in Congress who don't believe that veterans um, are eligible for, to be held to a, or given a higher standard, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so... Would we be that like privileged? Yes and no. I mean, mm -hmm. I still get compensation. I receive um, 90 percent, and mm -hmm. that's, that's approximately $1,600 a month, mm -hmm. okay? And I do work for a living. I pay taxes, um, and I have no issue with that. But what we've done to advocate for Congress and what we still need to do is, is that at the end of the day, if you take this away, I'm not working. I'm not meeting people. I'm not doing these kinds of things because now you got to come to my house. And right now my house is inaccessible and we're going to keep it that way for as long as possible. Okay? Um, but I suffer chronic pain with the conditions that I have. Um, I'm on medication for my chronic pain. Um, several years ago in Congress, they wanted um, that for not what we call non-service connected veterans, it's eight dollars for a prescription, um, and so one of the congressmen in, Con in Connecticut turned around and said, "Well, I don't understand because they wanted to elevate it to fifteen dollars." And it's like, "Well, fifteen dollars for a ninety-day prescription? No, congressman, that's incorrect. It's fifteen dollars for a thirty-day prescription. So it's forty-five dollars every three months." Oh. I thought it was $15 for 90 days. No, it's $15 for every 30 days of prescription. At the time, I was taking 10 prescriptions. At the time, matter of fact, I'm close to that again. So that's um, 10 prescriptions, $150 every month for a year. Now, the 
the, because we advocated for that, it's still $8. And there is a cap that if you exceed that, then you don't pay anymore. We also advocated for the fact that at non do you know the difference between a service-connected veteran and a non-service-connected veteran? I'm a service-connected veteran. My injury is considered active duty, not combat. Active duty is the same thing in military terms as it is in um, civilian terms. Is, is the term is, um, I just had it. Um, well, go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, civilian is, is um, workers' comp. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So mine is an active duty injury because I was not in combat. All right? And, and civilian side is workers' comp. So because mine is active duty, I receive compensation. Now, if, if um, a, an individual who did their four years went in pretty much the same way they, or got out the same much, pretty much the same way they went in, then six months a year, they suffer a car accident. Now they're a paraplegic. Now they are considered non-service connected. If they got out on an honorable discharge, they can use the VA services. But back then, they had to pay $50 for every medical appointment they had up until two years ago. So if you had, and if you were hospitalized, I believe, depending upon the hospitalization, it was $50 a day for your hospitalization. So I have fellow veterans paying, basically paying for my medical care as well, mm -hmm. because they have to pay their way. I don't have to pay anything. So we advocated, and even the VA itself advocated to say, you know what, in the grand scheme of things, what we would not get is nothing compared to the budget, the VA, the overall VA budget. So now a non-service connected veteran no longer has to pay co-pays. Um, I believe they still have to pay co-pays for medication, don't quote me on that one, but for medical appointments, for emergency visits, for in-hospital stays, no more co-pays. Mm -hmm. For individuals who currently live on SSI or SSDI, that's a big difference in their life, a big difference in their life. Um, I know a number of individuals who currently live on that. Um, you know, can they work? That's a choice they get to make. I, I'm not going to make that choice for them. Okay. Now, Deborah, um, let's see. First of all, if a person was interested in contacting the New England chapter, the Paralyzed Veterans of America, what would be the best way to go about it? Um, we have a website. It's www.n, Nancy Edward Peter Victor Apple, um, nepba.org. Um, our, our phone number is 800-660-1181. Um, and we have a chapter newsletter that goes out. Um, you know, give us a call, check us out online. Um, mm -hmm. We have our, our, our own website and our own newsletter. Um, and then uh, PVA has its own website as well. It's www.pva.org, and you can find us that way as well. Okay. And you're also on the steering committee for the Mass Women's Veterans Network. I am. And what do you do with them? Um, we, we, we do our best to get as many women involved. Um, one of the things I've learned over the years is how many people either did not know of their entitlements mm -hmm. for VA services, or um, I, I've learned too that what happens is people who were in the military got out in, in the same condition they went in and go to work and you know they have their own health insurance. Um, I met a person when I was going through chemotherapy a couple years ago who suffers um, rheumatoid arthritis. When this person retired, um, the company decided to limit this person's um, medical um, entitlement. And so this person really had no other choice but to come to the VA. And it's like, well, why would you have waited so long? It's like, well, and, you know, God bless my late father, my natural father, um, he used to think the VA was charity. Oh, that used to make me so mad. <laughs> it's like, so what? I'm accepting charity. Thank you. 
but the same with my father, um, he had to use the VA too because he, he was on SSI for a while. He'd broken his ankle, it was never set properly, and he had trouble walking, and he got nowhere else to go. Um, and because he got out on, a, on an honorable discharge, um, he was allowed to use VA services. So it's like, um, and I actually ragged him once. And I said, so what do you think of the charity now, Dad? <laughs> um, so, but, uh, you know, I, I, I can't do without the VA. It has its good points and bad points, just like every medical facility in this country. They all have good points and bad parts. Um, you make the bad parts better by letting people know about them. You don't turn around and say, well, oh my God, I had a bad experience. I can't go back. I might not go back to the same service until I know there are different people there. I might go use a different facility, but I still use the VA. Mm -hmm. And um, that is one of the things that we do have in our chapter. We have a great rapport with the VA medical centers in our area. Um, I can go and bang on the executive director's door or the um, director's door at the VA in West Roxbury um, and ask the associate director if she has time to talk to me. Mm -hmm. I don't need an appointment, you know. And if she's available, great. If she's not, mm -hmm. I'll send, you know, send her an email. And, uh, you know, make an appointment if, that, if that's what works best for both of us, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Deborah, is there anything else you'd like to relate about your military experiences? Um, I wouldn't trade it for the world. All the good parts, the bad parts, the stupid parts. Um, lessons well learned, never repeated in, <laughs> since then. Um, but, you know, I, I have five nieces, five or seven great nieces, um, four, four nephews, um, five nephews actually, one mm -hmm. deceased, and, you know, the two youngest ones. Um, I still advocate it. Go in the military. You want an education? You want to travel? You want, you know, to be a better person? Join the military. Um, there is a camaraderie there, whether it's actually in the military or veteran status, that you will never find anywhere else, no matter what you do. Not, not from school programs, not from uh, going to your uh, high school reunion every five years, not from jobs you've had with, you know, for 10 or 20 years, I'm sorry, you're not gonna find the camaraderie. Mm -hmm. When I go to the veterans games, people I've met nine years ago, hi Deb, how are you? That's our annual meeting, that's our get together. And, and it may be that one time a year, mm -hmm. but that's it. And you know what, I look forward to it. Mm -hmm. When I don't go, it's for whatever reasons I don't get to go. Um, you know, it's like, you going this year? No, I can't go. Well, 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 and it's like, look, not this year, next year we'll go. Um, like I said, 2006, Alaska was an, a, a very big expense, but we turned it into a vacation, three week vacation. It was great, it was great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I would advocate, you know, joining the military, mm -hmm. so. Okay, well, Deborah Freed of the New England Paralyzed Veterans of America, I'd like to thank you so much for coming in and speaking with us as part of the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. I